Hi there guys, welcome to the latest episode of The Cryptoverse, your regular dose of news and commentary on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and blockchains. I'm your host, Chris Coney. And today I'm with a gentleman that I admire very much. This is Josh Shigala, co-founder and CEO of Voltoro, a one-of-a-kind online exchange where you can trade between gold and Bitcoin. And you can find out more at voltoro.com. So Josh, welcome to The Cryptoverse. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be on. Great to have you, mate. Now, I saw a news story this morning, which actually you tweeted it. You said that iMessage is now integrated with Circle uh, on the back end to allow Bitcoin to be traded between people who use iMessages on Apple phones. So what does yeah. that mean? That's not, that's not Facebook Messenger, is it? That's the iMessage text message. Is that right? That's right. So Apple iPhone, so every single iPhone now effectively becomes a bank, a mobile bank. Um, uh, the thing is that it, it's slowly integrating this, this money protocol at a, and you know, Bitcoin is this money protocol that we've, that we've never had before. We've always had, uh, messaging protocols on the internet. The internet's made up of two things, right? It's made up of information and money and, information it's wonderful at we you know it spreads and moves and you can duplicate it and instant all around the world money we're like got this 1950s technology and bent it and patched it and stabbed things through it to sort of make it work in this in this new thing but it doesn't and uh bitcoin absolutely works it's a stunning technology and for uh, now this company that's sitting on top of the bitcoin protocol has um integrated itself into Apple's iMessenger who uh, they've opened their API up to allow bots to um, to take part in this messaging right. uh, ecosystem and Circle's built uh, an interface to that which is really so cool. Do, do you know how that works from the user's point of view? I suppose you, I've not used it yet. Have you, have you actually used it? I haven't used it yet either. Okay. I just uh, had a quick... I, I, I think it's just I actually have an Android so right um, yeah well, the, <laughs> but maybe uh, maybe they've done that because of I I use the telegram messenger app right yes. and that and that for a while has had like a bot system in it and telebit I think it's called telebit is the integration where you can just send other telegram users Bitcoin right and you just right. you just chat to the bot you tell it you know send Bitcoin to this person that person and then you have to have to have to have a Bitcoin wallet because it's built in, right? If you install the Telebit, it's not even an app, it's just a little add-on for Telegram. And then immediately you've got a Bitcoin wallet inside the, te the Telegram Messenger system. So you don't have to, you know, it's just all built in underground and then you can just send wow. money between it, people, right? Are I'm, the I'm private a big, keys stored well, on the, your local phone? The technicalities of that, I can't tell you. There's something yeah. I should look into in a bit deeper if I'm going to talk about it like that. <laughs> um, but I do, I do admire Circle. They're actually a British company, and the way they've set up their interface to be much more Facebook slash PayPal like. I mean, even the the languaging they use on their website is far more emoticon, chatty, text messagey type of stuff. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And I've mm. I've used Circle myself. If I get paid an invoice in Bitcoin, my accountant says I can't keep it in that because I have to account for it in British pounds. So I use Circle to transact it back. And okay. it just basically they send it to my debit card and then it goes into the bank. So it's super, super simple and better yet. Too easy. I get good rates on the when they buy the Bitcoin off me, it's pretty mm. pretty good rates. Anyway. Oh, that's good. Yeah, good to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, they're a good company. I, I, they were the first to really figure out how to get credit card payments to Bitcoin because this has always been a bottleneck in the Bitcoin space. I remember when I first got into that Years ago, people would be like, oh, can I buy with credit cards? It's always been no, because credit cards can do a chargeback. So what mm -hmm. people would do is buy Bitcoin with the credit card, get the Bitcoin, and then charge back the credit card payment. So they'd have the money and the Bitcoin, and the person that had the Bitcoin is holding an empty bag. Wow. And so yeah. Circle somehow fixed that. I think they're using a certain, only a certain type of credit card that has a certain security functionality, which has... KYC attached to it, so someone can do a tar chargeback, but if they do it too often, then they just get blocked or something. I'm not sure. Yeah, you mean like a verified by Visa type of thing? Mm. You know, you have to put mm. your PIN code in at the checkout and things like that. Then that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so people were buying the Bitcoin, charging it back, and ended up with with both. 
mm. as a challenge. And on top of that, yeah. to, be, to me... That's why people have always used wire transfers uh, to yes. buy Bitcoin because... Yeah, you can't but I mean, even that. then, I've heard about those being reversed. If you, if you call it as a fraudulent transaction and then they, <laughs> and then they claw it, it back, it can right? Be, but it's, yeah, but it's a lot harder and it takes a long time. Right. To me, buying Bitcoin with a credit card doesn't make a lot of economic sense because you've still got maybe a 3% transaction fee in there. Um, and an exchange is probably taking a percentage as well. So you might end up paying... 5% of your funds in fees between Visa and an exchange. So it's um, it's not the most effective way of buying it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, 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 there's definitely better ways. All right. So there's another story you tweeted. And this article was from Fortune magazine. And it says, Larry Summers finds banks might be more dangerous now than in 2008. What does that mean? Well... You know, the, the big problem that we had in 2008 with these derivative markets out of control and no one knew what were in these derivatives. Uh, I mm. think there was 87 trillion or something uh, floating about and no one knew what was backing this stuff up. And all of a sudden, what was not what was meant to be backing it up, which was uh, these subprime law mortgages, mm -hmm. all of a sudden disappeared. Uh, well, didn't all of a sudden, they were slowly not paying back and eventually some bright spark started shorting and realized and uh, and the whole thing collapsed so what's happened now is that they've basically rebranded all of this nonsense um and called it something else but continue doing it. and this is the problem when you just socialize uh, problems and mm. and privatize um uh, profits if you if you just bail the bat out they don't learn. They're like, oh, cool. Uh, so that means we can do this again, right? Because we're just going to get bailed out because we're too big to fail. And um, and so a lot of uh, people are worried that now that there's not a 87 trillion, there's now 130 trillion in derivatives floating about, um, that it could be a lot worse. And you know we're already at negative interest rates. So right. what are they going to keep on going more and more negative? How how far will we go? And some of these negative interest rates are already starting to be passed down to retail banks. Yes. Uh, and they're passing it on to their customers for the first time. We've seen that in Austria and, uh, and, and uh, the lower parts of Germany. Some banks down there are starting. If you have over 100,000 euros in the bank, they start charging you those negative interest, rate, interest right. rates. So that means you have to pay to keep your money there. Even though, and, it's, uh, even though it's a digital deposit, effectively, it doesn't really like gold as a physical cost to protect it whereas digital fiat i mean what are they charging you the rent for you know what i mean and i feel like you're getting value for that do you well not only that i mean i i gave a talk in helsinki the other day about um you know, bitcoin and and gold and all this stuff and i said the first thing i asked was would you trust your money your life savings to a professional gambler if they said well i'll give you one percent return anyone Anyone? No one in the crowd put their hand up. Uh, understandably, right? I well, that's very totally logical, right? It, it's totally logical. But then you say, um, "This is how banks work, right? We all know how banks work. How do banks work? Well, they go and speculate with the funds and and uh, hope to make a profit, and it usually works because they got very clever ways of hedging risk. And but sometimes it doesn't, and you see that in Greece, in, in Cyprus. I mean. If you said to anybody the weekend before Lehman Brothers, the largest bank in the world, collapsed, the weekend before, that you would have been looked at like you were nuts, right. that you were a crazy conspiracy nut, nut. But what happened? On Monday, boom, everyone fired. The whole company collapses. So banks collapse. They make the wrong bets. It happens. And this is why having a hedge in something other than fiat, something other than the one banking system. And I'm not saying that banks are all corrupted and and they're all a nightmare and they're, they're, they're about to collapse, not at all. Um, I'm just saying it's very, very clever to diversify out of that systemic risk some mm -hmm. of your funds. And um, I was talking to a girl of my age that grew up in Russia. She's, she's seen currency collapses twice. And her family all of a sudden became very wealthy during those collapses because they were clever enough to put a little bit in gold and a little bit in US dollars outside of the Russian ruble. So all of a sudden, 
everyone around her was poor and all of a sudden they were rich. They were just very, very middle class normal before. And so the problem now is that every currency is so intertwined and intertangled that you start having domino effects. The mm-hmm. old thing of when America catches a cold, uh, sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. This is what happens. You get this domino effect where, and we saw a little bit of it in 2008 you saw one bank freeze uh, liquidity in the states another bank another bank then over in europe then over in australia started freezing so it started having this huge knock-on effect and this is the first time because everything's so intertwined so you can't just hedge a little bit in us dollars anymore i mean you could for sure and it's probably maybe it might be a good plan but something totally bank independent is is physical asset of gold it's been around for three thousand years as a money and and currency the average currency's lifespan is 27 years so it's, 27 um, definitely, years hey eh? yeah the average yeah. currency's life size is 27 years that is yep. crazy that's crazy pure fiat yeah i mean the so the, the pound has lasted a lot longer but it's only been on pure paper for a very short time. Mm, absolutely. Uh, oh, yeah. So you're talking about when it, when it, it could, when it becomes purely fiat, it's got yeah. 27 years to live, max. <laughs> yep. That's been the average. That's like so, cur- cur- uh, currency terminal that's... illness. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, I mean, you know, Bitcoin has this obituary that people bring up because every time, you know, uh, some exchange goes down or something, they, the press says, Bitcoin is dead. You know, Bitcoin hacked, or and this obituary is counted every time they've said it's dead, and of course it's not. It keeps on living and growing and getting bigger. Right. And the I think it's something like eighty times it's been pronounced dead over the six years. I think someone's got a log of the Bitcoin obituaries chronicled over time, and they keep updating it every time Bitcoin dies. They add it to the list to show you like, when are you going to realize this isn't going anywhere? Right, Um, right. Well, and gold has got an obituary of three thousand years. I mean, we, humanity has thrown everything at this, you know, right. world wars, uh, everything. It's gone through, gone through everything, and it's still there as a as a store of value, and and it's kept up with inflation. So it's it's a very there are problems with gold though, right? So it, it's very hard to move. It's very mm. it's very heavy. It's hard to verify for the normal person. Um, it's it's not that divisible, although theoretically it's divisible down to the atomic structure because it's a base metal. Um, it, it's physically very, you know, hard to make different deriv- derivatives. Right. Um, but it's very, very stable over the three thousand years. It's it's held its value. Bitcoin is modeled mathematically modeled on gold, meaning it's mined into existence. It's it's a precious number that's found instead of a precious metal that's found mm-hmm. and uh, spent into existence. But um, but it's totally opposite than gold. It's it's uh, very easy to verify. It's fully so fast to move around. It's easy to move around. It's extremely divisible, but it's extremely volatile. So if you can combine those two together, you get very, very close to what I feel is perfect currency, perfect, perfect money. money. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's you know there's nothing that perfect, but but we're getting close. That's right, absolutely. What matters, right? So you were talking about inflation there, right? And gold being a good uh, kept up with inflation. And we were talking just a minute ago about negative interest rates and about even I as a retail banking customer got my email about two weeks ago from NatWest Bank in the UK saying it's time to cut your interest rates on your instant savings accounts, right? Which was the most recent trickle down. And I think now the mm-hmm. retail rate is about a quarter of a percent. So it's it's happening, right? Now, uh, I, I, have a, I have a sense that the average Joe will sit there and see that and go, Oh, well, I'm still getting interest at least, right? Mm. It's not as bad as a negative mm. interest rate. But it's like, wait, wait a minute. This is where a lack of financial education might be hurting people because it's not growing at a quarter of a percent a year because the purchasing power is eroding faster than that, right? Right. Um, and, and no one can really tell us what the real rate of inflation is because um, I don't think it would be a very nice number if the financial institutions really told us that inflation was maybe 5%, 6% in real terms in terms of price inflation. And then they target 2% and so on. But even if they, all right, let's say, they, let's say they're on par with their own goals, 
let's say inflation is 2% and it always hits target, well, that means the money is devaluing 1.75% per year in the average savings mm. account, which is like, yeah. wow. And if you've got 100 grand or more, it's just money just vanishing, right? Yes, yeah. Crazy, crazy. It's, it's, it's really interesting because in once you start getting into cryptocurrency um, or, or, or any of these new currencies, you get very people get very specific on how these currencies are made. So you'll be like, oh, how, what's the pre-mine on that? How many are uh, pre-mined beforehand? What's the inflation rate? They want to know everything about it. But with paper currency, we're like, ah, oh, okay, the Bank of England gives it to me, uh, you know, lends it out and uh, I don't need to know much more. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting. Once you dive into these crypto, people start educating themselves a lot more and start caring a lot more about those base, base issues which are very important issues. Um, yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of, uh, especially with the internet now, you know, with a click a button, you can watch an amazing documentary for free about how currency works. What is money? And most people have never asked themselves, what is money? Where does it come from? Right. So that thing you were talking about there where people delve into crypto and there's this, I'll call it an unfair level of scrutiny that cryptocurrencies yeah. get put under. So there's, yeah. there's the fiat world behind me here. And I'm looking at this new stuff over here, the crypto, and I'm I'm giving it hell, right? About like, yeah. is it secure? Is it used by child pornography traders and pornography websites and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And, and it's so superior to the system that I don't question. But you were saying that people like get stuck, oh, okay, this is how money works. It's not nothing to do with cryptocurrency. That just starts the conversation. But then, I would hope that eventually people loop back around and go holding these guys up to that standard as well. And they go, actually, that's right. terrible money, right? And I would hope that's the way it goes. The skepticism yeah. loops back and then you look back at, you know, your old friend Fiat and go, that's terrible, right? Yeah. But you never yeah. knew. You never knew. And that's the best thing I think crypto, uh, Bitcoin did for, even if it doesn't survive right, or whatever, right? doesn't matter. The most important thing is that people start questioning it. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like um, there's like absolutely a, like in your nervous system. If you press and keep your finger there, eventually you cease to feel it because the nerve habituates. Mm. I I almost mm. see it like that. Something that you don't question, like an elbow in your side, eventually you cease yeah. to feel it. You know what I mean? Until until you move. Yeah, oh, very well put. Very well put. Very well put. I I also see it as this this funny thing where you know. People are bla People say, "Oh, look, drugs are being bought with Bitcoin," and you, and a you think, well, anything that that sort of me to me says it's money that, that people are using as <laughs> it's value. It's useful. I'm not saying it's good, but what people then say is, "We've got to stop Bitcoin." Well, no, you've got to stop drug dealers if that's what you're against. You've got to stop drug dealers, not the money, and. You know, when you look at, turn it around, like you said, turn around and look at the other way, hang on a minute. So USD is 99% probably, or, or fiat money in general is used 99.9% .9 of the time to buy the seeds, pay the farmers, pay the uh, the water supply, all the all the stuff that goes into growing poppies, then grows uh, into to processing the it. fuel to, to transport it. To be, you know. Yeah, to be heroin and the fuel to transport all the way to rolling it up and snorting up your nose. You're using fiat currency. <laughs> you know, there's not one step of the way that you're not using it. Yet you don't get any scrutiny of ban this money because it's used. No, you're saying like normal. No, well, we've got to look at policing uh, our laws if we think that's a just law. Then policing it. I mean, I think quite personally that the war on drugs is a bit ludicrous. And there's much better ways of dealing with that issue. But uh, anyway, that's that's uh, that's a different topic. But well, yeah. um, it's funny that blaming the currency instead of blaming the thing that's illegal. It's funny. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I talk about this because I'm into. Um, I'm always looking for the the, the the linchpin. You know, the systemic point. What's the one thing I can work on that will make the most difference overall? Right. And we touched on it earlier on. You were talking about. I believe that equal access to information for everybody, key, because misinformation, disinformation, lack of financial education has a massive, profound impact. And then equal access to money, finance, right? Which is another thing that mm. crypto has done. 
I'm mean, talking about equal access. Yes. What people do with it, that's another story. That's individual. But yeah. those two basic human rights, equal access to information, equal access to finance, those that's the platform which someone can build a successful life, right? Absolutely. Um, and on the point that you were saying about we got to stop Bitcoin from being bought with drugs or whatever, well, I often draw these diagrams in my mind. Like, So if we have a pie chart and maybe of all the transactions in the world, the portion of that pie chart, uh, the number of transactions that relate to drug transactions is microscopic, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other 99.9% .9 of transactions that are used for all sorts of stuff, buying courses from Cryptoversity, buying gold from Voltoro, and all of the benefits to the 99.9%, .9%, we're saying we should take the benefits away from those 99% to prevent the 1% from doing bad things with it. So the net contribution to the world's well-being is massively negative right yeah. so we could we could we could improve the world by 99 percent, but instead we'll we'll prevent one percent damage that just doesn't add up does it like so your net gain or loss is a massive loss to humanity i mean as a whole good point very very good point it, i saw a, a list of everything that's bought with crypto or the most popular things bought with crypto and it and the list was the most boring thing ever. It was like the number one thing was mattresses <laughs> on overstocked uh, bedding or something. It was like it was the most, you know. And the second biggest thing was actually uh, giving to charity. A lot wow. of charitable stuff to to wells in Africa. To uh, you know, it was it was amazing. And and I've you know I've been in the Bitcoin space for a very long time, and and I've always seen that uh, things like Sean's outposts. Um, and other other charities are, are big um, parts of the of the economy because it's so fluid. You can just give it, and it's also transparent. You, if if a charity decides to actually show exactly where that money's flowing to mm. afterwards, they can they can prove it on the blockchain, and, and, and that's stunning. It, wasn't it thirty eight bitcoins someone anonymously donated to some African water project like the, within the last week? I think you tweeted that as well. I was like, yeah, right, wow. Yep. So if you want to be an anonymous donor and you want to make sure the money gets there, I mean, to be honest, I, I've become desensitized to a lot of the cinema ads and the TV ads that are like, look at these poor starving children and so forth. The thing that mm. the thing that really prevents me from donating is that I don't trust these companies, quite frankly. Do mm. I want to help? Of course, right? Do I trust mm. the money to get there? Unfortunately not, right? Yeah. And that's the problem. Yeah. It's not necessarily that these companies are corrupt. It's just that I do not trust them, right? And that's where the it's problem is. It's tragic. Lies. It's absolutely tra tragic. And, and this, you know, what it does is it forces us to deal with centralized government to, to help people because they're the only things we can end up trusting now, which we don't even trust really. Um, mm. is, 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 so for instance, um, a lot of uh, homeless people, we have, to give, we have to have so much money being, and so much trust being put into social uh, systems, whereas a lot of people would rather donate but they are skeptical um, of of where this money goes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's actually let's take it down to the micro level. Most people who walk past a homeless guy won't give him any money or she because they go, oh, they'll just buy booze with it. How do mm. you know? <laughs> so yeah. actually, the way around that is to just buy him a sandwich and give it to them. <laughs> yeah. Or they say, why should I? I've already paid my taxes and the state fixes it. So they take away. Uh, what hap what ends up happening is you're taking away the heart of giving mm. by using force of the state to force you to give and then they, that then give, gets given. And if, if the person isn't getting helped because they don't have an address that the state can help, mm. they don't get anything of that. And so, and, and people get really angry, oh, I've got to ask for a dollar again. And and really it's, um, they, they, they feel that um because they feel that they've already been forced to pay for these people. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, that is very interesting, and it's and it's yeah, a perceptual so problem. Because if they if they perceive that it's the government's responsibility to take care of the vulnerable, and they see they've already paid into that pot, they just ignore the homeless person. It's like, oh, there's surely exactly. there's some scheme or something that can get sorted out. You know, I've already go get some of the money that I paid into that thing, which is mm. a real generalized way of looking at things it's like yeah but do you actually know how the process works and do you actually know if you ever been homeless and tried to get help 
and do you know the system? No, people just don't go that deeply into it. They just have these generalizations mm-hmm. and they stick to them as if they're reality. And that's that's what's tragic yeah. to me. Yeah, so it'd be interesting to see how digital currencies can disrupt these things. Um, especially, uh, you know, I mean, we could look at uh, ways of having a, a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization that gets crowdfunded mm-hmm. and slowly releases money to people that are in need. You know, there's so many amazing things now that are that are available to us, which weren't available to us before. Absolutely. So on the point there, skipping back a few steps, because we're going to loop back there. Yep. You were talking about diversifying one's investments, right? And then Robert Kiyosaki for years has, has been advocating for personal responsibility when it comes to your own finances. And even an advisor, I mean, every time I get an end of year set of accounts from my British accountant, the front page basically asks me to sign them to absolve the accountant from any liability whatsoever to do with the accuracy of the records, right? Now, do do I 100% understand accounting law? Do I have 100% certainty these accounts are legally correct? No, because I didn't take an accounting degree, and that's why I hire the guy. However, I still have to sign to say that I am taking on full responsibility if this guy messes up, right? Which is interesting. And that's kind of how solicitors, you know, lawyers work and all this kind of thing. So personal responsibility already is placed upon us. So yeah. that's the way I see it, especially in the UK anyway. So if buying into an illusion that um, someone else will bail me out, government or whatever, that's actually false anyway. And, and that accountancy example is a good one. So... If I one day get a tax investigation and my accountant made a mistake, I'm fully aware that I'm going to have I'm going to get my bottom smacked for that, even though I couldn't have prevented it. And it's just it's just this is the way the system works, right? So right. there's a there's a phrase that I suppose everyone knows, which is "Don't put all your eggs in one basket," which mm. is so easy to understand. Um, but there's this what do you call it? Cognitive dissonance between. Um, what you think and what you do, right? the belief versus behavior thing. So to, to have all of your assets in one particular category is is a bad idea. And that goes on to another yes. article from the Wall Street Journal that you tweeted out, which says, German savers lose faith in banks, start stashing cash at home. And there was a fellow with his arm on this big steel safe saying, hey, I'm making loads of money selling these safes. So <laughs> what's going on there, mate? Yeah, I mean, there, there's 1.6 trillion dollars, uh, euros, sorry, in cash savings sitting in banks. Right. Um, Ger- Germans are notorious for for holding because of the wars and, and stuff that have happened. And they, uh, from their grandparents, they've been told to, you know, put heaps of nuts uh, so their cheeks <laughs> like are out here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, but uh, no, to save a lot. And now people get bombarded every single day with headlines of the shaky banking system. Mm. How Deutsche Bank is now trying to make a deal to partner with Commerzbank and if it doesn't go through, maybe they might need government help. That um, that a gold ETF that Germany, uh, that Deutsche Bank was running, uh, they have refused to give physical delivery. That um, That the stock market is down X, that Greece is shutting its banking system uh, and uh, disallowing people to move more than 300 euros a month, that uh, Cyprus did the same thing, right. that uh, Spain might be on the, you know, every day, boom, 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 uh, Rio de Janeiro just missed a debt payment to France, Puerto Rico defaulted. You know, it's this sea of uncertainty. And people are like, uh, okay, I'm going to take my money out. Now, I was talking to a person who grew up um uh, in, in Russia, I think, did I mention this before? Where she survived purely because she had some gold and, and her family survived because they had some gold. When you say survived, you mean like was able to buy food? Yeah, was was able to buy and feel fairly wealthy. But the same thing is happening now that people remember this, especially in Europe and think, right, I'm, I'm going to diversify out. I'm going to keep cash. Mm. Um, and they're, they're now passing these negative interest rates down. So... Um, they would rather keep cash in a safe than keep it in a bank where they have to pay interest at, for the privilege that the bank goes off and speculates with it and maybe goes ca- bankrupt. So what's happening is people are pulling 
um, a certain amount of money, maybe not all of it, but pulling out. I know some people that are pulling all of it out. Uh, I mean, I'm in, in the crypto space, but I've also talked to general, uh, you know, normal Joes. I talked to a taxi driver a month ago and he said, yeah, um, I don't keep anything in the bank. And I, and he said, um, oh, and I was talking to an investor from Russia who said the same thing. No, don't leave any money in the bank. Don't trust them. So it, it started to become more and more of this mindset. And banks have a really hard time holding customers. Their customer acquisition cost is huge. Mm -hmm. And then for one to leave, it's like, no, please, please. Don't. And they know that this is happening. So they're starting to invest in products like what we're making um, to allow people to hold value. And this is what we do at Voltura is allow people to buy gold that's secured in their name as their property. So even if something happens to Voltura, if we, the management get hit by a car, it doesn't matter. The gold is in the vault as, as the person's property. We don't speculate with it. It's not on our balance sheet. It's not, even liquidators couldn't touch our client's gold. Mm. So, so that's a very different story than um, than a bank when you and many people don't understand this either when you give money to a bank it's not their property anymore hmm. it's the bank's property and so they can go off and speculate with it of course and, and do all the things with it but many people don't realize that they just have a promise to pay back whenever you have you have it but it's it's the bank's liability when you give the money right in british law it's effectively you are lending the money to the bank and you're then just a creditor that is due a repayment which they can default right. on. And if they refuse the demand for repayment, then it's a civil court case. You have to take them to court and sue them because they broke the contract, which says, yeah, as soon as you want it back, we'll give you it. So they give you their word when you put it in the bank. And if you say, can I have it? And they say, no, you got to take them to court, right? With what money, right? It's yeah. in the bank. <laughs> Can't pay me legal bills, right? It's so that's a bit of a problem. And now they're going to charge you for that privilege. <laughs> To lend them money. I mean, it, 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 the whole system well, that's crazy. is so when you think like on the that. verge of nuts. <laughs> it's <laughs> what? On the verge of nuts. In the and, verge and, it, of total and it relies on people not land. knowing that, don't you think? Confidence mm, yeah, in the system it, relies on it being misunderstood. And I, 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 everyone I talk to who doesn't, who's not into, who's not very well financially educated or doesn't know about crypto, I almost want to go, um, look, if you knew what I knew, <laughs> like literally, if I could just download from the matrix of my brain to your brain you would just run out that door and take all kinds of action um but for people like you and i you may have had this i mean you actually mentioned it earlier on whenever you because it's so alien because the the map in people's minds of how the finance system works is so far removed from the way it really works that whenever we try and close the gap we immediately get branded a conspiracy theorist or paranoid or, or, or. So it's a really difficult problem to solve. That's one of the reasons why I started Cryptoversity and how I'm, I'm desperately trying to focus on seducing people on the basis of, of just purely how they can benefit, like, um, you know, how, how to get paid Bitcoin to blog or just all the normal stuff people are looking for. So rather than trying to sell crypto as a concept, we'll just sell people on what they're already looking for and just have crypto in the background as the way, the mechanism. You know what I'm saying? Cool. So, I mean, you're, you're in that same market. It's never mind the Bitcoin thingy, right? Mm. Um, what if anyone in the world, as long as you can get hold of some Bitcoin, you could exchange it for gold in a Swiss, it's a Swiss vault, yeah? Voltoro? Yeah, currently, it's a Swiss vault. Swiss vault, right? It's a Swiss, it's the second largest vaulting facility in Europe. Yeah. Right. And before I signed up with you, because I've got some gold in Voltoro, before I signed up, you know, I did my due diligence on you. And I, yeah. I checked out the facility, which is a reasonably impressive looking facility, right? And they um, they store the gold in little gold cubes, right? Is that how? Uh, no, they, they, uh, they, they have good delivery bars. So okay. the, because the gold bullion, the London bullion markets are the second most liquid markets in the world under the Forex exchange. Mm -hmm. So um, they need, uh, but there's this standard delivery bar that, that gets branded by the London Bullion Markets Association. So uh, that's, that's to test for purity and, and all the rest of it. So that it can just flow. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we, we deal with those uh those bars so that we if someone needs to get out bitcoin again we can we have total liquidity and can move that stuff fast so oh, yeah. um, who does the little idea. cubes is bit gold 
Oh, sorry, yeah, of course, yeah. That's yep. actually got confused between two of them there. I was going to ask you about that, the settlement side of things, because you've got to maintain that balance between the client funds who owns gold and Bitcoin and then liquidating it to keep it all, all the orders filled and whatever. So you've just yeah. actually reconciled that in my mind. So there are um, there is gold moving in and out from the London bullion exchange and back again to maintain that um, liquidity. Yeah. yeah, so we're always about, because we have a full proof of reserve, um, it means that we we have to always be above reserve. And this is another different thing from banks. Banks can have, you know, you lend them $100 or you put deposit $100 mm -hmm. in the bank. They can lend out 99.9% .9 of that to other people and, and do whatever they want with it. With us, we, we can't. You put in $100, it's it's there as gold. It's sitting in the vault. We can't move it, because it's not our property. Do anything with it. It's yours. And so um, we have to always buy above reserve, keep buying more. Right. So, and then um, as uh, if there's a lot of volatility, a lot of uh, price movement, a lot of people trading, then we buy either more bars, bigger uh, chunks of it, or... Um, the good thing about a full marketplace, so we're the only people where thousands of people trade, is that someone wants to buy, but someone also wants to sell. So the gold doesn't actually move, it just changes ownership. Right. So, yeah. so you said earlier on that like, the customers have, they, they legally own the gold that's on deposit rather than you owning it and being a custodian, right? Yeah. So, yep. and you said if Voltoro failed, that would still, it'd still be their property and so on. So. Yep. How do you how do you reconcile that between because um, in my account I haven't fully verified my name and address and so on. So mm. how do who from a legal point of view, it's my account that owns the gold rather than a person. It yeah, it's your email address. And we ask people because we have this we have this ability because gold is a good and mm. um and you're allowed in European under European law to buy seven thousand five hundred euros worth of a good without pulling your pants down and showing everything. Right. Uh, you know, giving giving full you know, IDs and everything right. else. And that's a really important um, uh, law to have because if you had to show your ID every time you went shopping for some groceries, um, the whole the whole thing would collapse it's because a- friction, right, uh, in the transaction. It's, it's a, not only friction, everybody's ID would already be stolen. Because it's the most ridiculous, and there's so many opportunities that, to copy it, like to swipe so it, easy copy to, it. Just, just one person takes a photo, your ID is gone, and it only takes you to lose it once, and you've lost it forever, and potentially sold on the internet multiple times. Multiple <laughs> within, times, within minutes, so, right? yeah, and, and and so this this whole system needs disruption anyway. But what uh, what we realized is that we can take advantage of that because developing countries. They, they, a lot of people living in developing countries don't have the paperwork to satisfy a lot of the KYC regulations that right. people like BitPay need, uh, people like Coinbase need. Um, now, there's no way to really, there's no way to launder money through us, uh, through Voltura anyway. Uh, I can go into that bit later on, but basically because there's, it's not a circle, it's, it's just an in and out road. So, um, so, but what happens is that every company that I talk to, they use someone like BitPay to hedge that volatility risk. No merchant wants to take some Bitcoin and then tomorrow it's worth half. <laughs> and they go to restock and they're like, oh, this sucks. So they, what they do is they take Bitcoin and instantly convert it to USD or, or to Great British Pound or to Euro, whatever they want. And then they, um, they can restock with that. Uh, what we wanted to allow is the developing countries who couldn't satisfy those laws to be able to hedge in gold and then when they need to restock, they can sell for Bitcoin again and, and pay for restocking in Bitcoin. Mm. So they accept Bitcoin, instantly hold gold, scan a QR code, sell that gold and off to Bitcoin. Okay. Because we go down to the cent. So Bitcoin is the currency yeah. and the gold is the store of value in that, ch in that chain. Exactly. Ah, that's interesting. Yep. That's very interesting. And that's fiat free because as long as as long as you use Bitcoin as the unit of account, as long as everything is priced in Bitcoin in the transaction, I mean, actually, both parties could end up holding the value in vault or gold at either end of the transaction. But yeah. the, the, there's actually very little friction in there because both people have confidence that they're 
value isn't going to erode because it's in gold. Um, the actual exchange itself is very, very lubricated because it's digital currency, Bitcoin, and yeah. all the benefits, security, transparency, blah, 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 instantaneous transfer and so on. And the, all of the, you know, you identify yourself to do that either. So it's, I like that actually. That's very good. And it's, and, it's, and that brings me to a point. A lot of people ask, why don't we back a, back a digital token, like a colored coin or something right. like that with gold? Why don't we have one gram equals this token? Like the Voltoro coin. And yeah, like Voltoro coin, let's say. And the issues are four the issues with that is that, First of all, it's illegal to mint your own currency. Um, to mint in it. most, yeah, to mint your own currency is is illegal in most countries, in most modern uh, civilized countries. Okay. Um, now, th th this is why Satoshi came up with Bitcoin, because nobody's minting this. It's it's decentralized. Nobody's creating it. No one single person is creating it that they can take down. But it's mm. it's decentralizing this currency. There's no one to to shut down. People have tried to make their private currencies, and they get shut down very very fast. You mean like the Liberty Dollar, for example? Like the Liberty Dollar, like e gold, in the '90s. So they get shut down. So by by creating a token that's backed by gold, you're effectively minting your own currency. So mm. the second problem is if two people trade that token uh, for something illegal, then if, that, if they're using that token and you're holding that store of value in, your vault, uh, in the vault for them, you're, you can be held liable uh, or held within that crime, even though you didn't even know it was happening. Um, due to the way certain laws are set up. So right. that's the second problem. The third problem is a problem of what's called demurrage. Demurrage is the cost of holding money. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, it's, it's more of an older concept to do with gold. But So for instance, gold, um, it costs money to store gold, to insure gold, to audit gold, to have big steel doors, men with guns. This all costs something, right? And this is a storage fee that's paid monthly. On Voltoro, it's 0.034%. So you pay like um, uh, 30 cents for $1,000 a year or something like that. Right. It, it's a very cheap, but it's still a, a cost that, that, add, that adds up. Now, if that, all you can do with a token is you have to take that cost from the token because you can't, reach out to a token holder if you if that token holder sends it to some random person we don't know who that is who's the holder now and we can't charge them for that cost mm. so we, we we you can automate it uh, by taking a little bit of value from that coin the problem is no one wants to hold a coin that goes down in value and we've seen this um, with Frycoin. Frycoin was a a, a demurrage coin um it, it was very early on it was about maybe four years ago three, three or four years ago. So it, a lot of people said, we need a coin that loses value over the time. That stops people hoarding it. It promotes people moving it around. So the longer you hold it, the more it, value it loses and that value gets distributed back around to the network. Right. Well, that's kind and, of like inflation because the purchasing power of the coin is eroding over time, which encourages you to spend right. it now because tomorrow it will buy less. Right, so it's this Keynesian theory behind this crypto coin, and everyone was like, "Yeah, this is amazing, brilliant!" It skyrocketed in price when it launched, and of course, collapsed and has flatlined ever since because nobody wants to hold the coin that loses value. And this goes back to what I was saying before: once you start getting to cryptocurrency, you start questioning these things. But no one questions that with euros or pounds or with anything else. Why um, not? Why? Yeah, it's just because familiarity blindness. Could be, could be. But Flycoin was a really good example. And what it shows to me, what I love about this whole crypto space is we can try out different economic models without having gulags, without having these guns pointing and forcing you into a certain economic theory structure, um, uh, uh, which has been the way in the past. You know, in, in Russia, that right, we're going to go with the Marxist's way of economic theory and we're going to force everyone to do that. Um, now we can try it and say, hey, does anyone want to hold this coin? Does anyone want to use this this economic theory of money? No, 
that everyone's flooded back to Bitcoin or back whatever Ethereum or whatever else. That was a question I was going to ask you earlier on, actually, which I think we've answered, which is, so how has the legacy, I'll call it the legacy finance system, been allowed to get so poorly maintained? Because you're like, the back end of the banking system in the West is this 50-year-old technology that sort of had both stuff bolted on and bolted on and bolted on and this is ancient infrastructure at the, at the very base of it and so on. How is it allowed to get to that point, right? And I think the answer is because there was no competition. So they didn't have to, right? If you, if you have a monopoly, that's why, you know, monopolies are generally a bad thing for the consumers is that the incentive to continually improve isn't there. Right. So absolutely that would to my mind is how the existing financial system has been, has been allowed to get to a point where it operates so poorly, poorly in terms of providing the customers with, you know, innovations for their life. Right. What do you think to that? Oh, absolutely. You know, Swift has been around longer than you know, when they came up with Swift, they people weren't were just starting to carry huge big battery packs and this telephone that that was uh, like really heavy and, and maybe you could fit it into your car um we're still using that and now we're walking around with smartphones with maps and bird's eye views and and sports trackers and everything else yet we're still using this ridiculous uh system uh with this t3 t plus five uh, um, settlement system in the background that takes three days and people actually uh, matching numbers in these huge warehouses absolutely ridiculous and the only reason it's being now revolutionized is because of Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin came along and said, hey, I can send a million dollars to Australia and no third party needs to be in the middle. There's no trusted need. So boom. And now they're going, oh, uh, 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 and now people are saying blockchain this, blockchain that, blockchain this, because uh, A, they don't want to say Bitcoin because it scares them too much. But uh, blockchain is 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 what will help them. And now, it, it, it really is, in Australia, we say competition, it keeps the bastards honest. And that, that's really what it's about is, is by, by competing, you keep the bastards honest. They, they, they can't just do whatever the hell they want. And, and the funny thing is, we find in the West, monopolies abhorrent. We, we really find them disgusting in every part of life except for currency. No, no, no. Currency, everybody knows we need a monopoly. The government can be the only one that issues that in this country. And it's not true. We need competing currencies. We need competition in currencies so that if one is running amok, if one is getting far too, you know, being printed to all hell, then people can go, you know what, there's a door. I'm going to exit it because I don't, I don't like what you're doing. And what they do then is everyone's exiting. Whoa, whoa, slow down on that printing press there, Joe, because people are moving away. And, and so it's really important. Competition is the key against corruption. Right. So this is interesting. So you're talking about like the old media is like bank failures, this, that, the other, terrible, 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 terrible. And what fascinates me about the legacy news is it never provides a suggestion of a solution. All it does is continually remind you of the problem and then leaves you there. So... What's someone to do with 200,000 euros, right? They're like yeah. paralyzed by fear. They're like, okay, I'm aware there's a terrible, terrible risk to my wealth, but no one's telling me what to do about it. It's almost like a hopeless situation. Um, I mean, because anything's outside of one's awareness may as well not exist, right? So they're like, think they're trapped in the fiat currency bubble and that's there's no way out, right? To their mind. So what, what are they to do? And, and what are these people doing? They're, what are they doing, right? Putting cash under the mattress, I guess, whatever they can think of. And that's mm. the back to the access of information thing is people will will engage in whatever strategies they have. You know, the best strategies they've got, they'll use them. So everyone's doing the best based on what they know, which is why, again, I do things like this. Because until, it's like the phrase, you don't know what you don't know until someone shows you. So how is some, someone ever supposed to know what Bitcoin is and how it can benefit them unless it somehow comes into their life, right? And that's where legacy media isn't mm. doing anybody any favors because they have people's attention. They've got a, 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 a link to their mind where they can stream whatever information they want. Um, and they are, to my mind, 
wholly failing in their responsibility because they're, they're not disseminating information that's empowering to those people. But, I mean, that's that presupposes that that's what their mission is, but I doubt it. Yeah, their, their mission is to get as many eyeballs as possible to watch their ads. And so generally fear is a very, very big... Uh, fear and sex, you know, are the ones, the clickbaits. Um, and so they'll they'll say, oh, Bitcoin, and they'll put fear on it and they'll say, oh, look, uh, you can have 0.3% interest instead of 0225 at this bank. So yay, that's the best one. Yeah, the, 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 you really get these, um, yeah, this, this ridiculous choices. Uh, I mean, the thing is, I... A lot of people blame the mainstream media, but I see now that we've had the internet for 20 years, you can't blame the mainstream media anymore. We need to realize that the information is out there and a lot of people are, are, are consciously ignoring information. Um, you know, We all have the same access now to the same information. It's not like the church is hiding the truth away from you anymore. It's not like that anymore. It's uh, we've, we. It's just one click away. But um, if uh, you know, there is a lot of there is a lot of information on the internet and trying to find the right stuff. Like you said, you don't know what you don't know. So um, yeah, you know, I, I I tend to think that the mainstream media is there just as dumb dumbified when you want to just switch off at the end of the day and watch whatever is fed into you, whereas. Uh, the, the 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 alternative media or the internet in general is there for hey I, I really want to find out about X so boom there it is okay instant uh, so you have to seek moment. it but something has to happen to you to create the incentive in the first place otherwise you're still just passively taking what the old media wants to feed you um, and yep. unfortunately there's a pattern that I notice anyway is that oftentimes the incentive is created after the fact. Because it's, it's pre prevention is better than cure. However, mm. that doesn't seem to have enough motivating power for most people. You know, it's only because it's not painful at that point. Even if even you saw, yeah, I recognize the problem over there. But until mm. it actually hits you and you feel the pain, that almost is where the motivation switch gets turned on. And I've never been, right. ever been able to reconcile that in my mind because I don't operate like that. But I, I yeah. just see that as a, a mind virus that I would like to delete you know you're right society. a lot of people a lot of people they can't uh and I, maybe that has something to do with the fact that um we we don't uh, sympathize anymore because uh, as much maybe uh, as a as a whole as a generalization because really if you can sympathize with someone else's problem you can learn from that problem and put it into yourself uh, rather than have to have to have to deal with that issue yourself. So, for instance, Greece, right? Greece now it's too late. They can't get their money out. It's starting to crawl back slowly now, but who knows when it's going to collapse again? But when it, when the banks shut their doors, uh, we noticed a few people that had Bitcoin were jumping onto Voltoro and dumping it into gold, or could, had access to Bitcoin. Um, the thing is that that it was already too late. Now, what the rest of Europe could do is say, oh, wow, look what happened to Greece. That could happen to us. Let's diversify risk out of systemic, uh, out, of, out, of this, out of this system um, so that we have something to fall back on. Um, and, you know, you don't need to wait for these super states to decide what to do with your money. You don't need to go, oh, I'm still waiting for the ECB to, to tell us what's going to happen with the... Uh, uh, with the banks and are we going to get a bailout? You don't need to wait, folks. You can literally go and diversify out of the ECB, out of the system right now. I'm not saying put all your savings into one basket. I'm saying grab it, think about what is within the system, what's out of the system, pay your taxes, be totally legal and and put put some savings away into something else. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I think that's a good note to end on, mate. That was the perfect advice to end on. So, Josh, thank you very much for being on the Cryptoverse. I hope you'll come back next time. I've got some more news stories in comment for us. Would you do that? For I us? absolutely will. All right, uh, nice yeah, one. absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm always here. I'm one click away. All right, nice one, mate. So we'll see you again soon. <laughs> Thanks.